Can everybody right. see that? Perfect. Well, thank you. I'm going to mute myself, but we can't, um, so we don't interrupt you guys. But take it away. Sounds good. Just let me know when you want to advance, Gabby. All right, sounds good. Uh, thanks, everyone, uh, for joining us today. Um, I appreciate taking the time um, to go over this with you all. Uh, as Lauren had said, we um, had conducted a vegetation survey in Jocelyn Lake this year. And I'm gonna go over some of the results um, that we found after that survey. Mark, if you wanna to go to the next slide. All right, so um, we conduct vegetation surveys by dividing a lake um, into AROSs, which are aquatic resource observation sites, um, which is something that Doug had done, um, you know, previously based on different community composition within the lake. Um, so the different depths, uh, which also translates to the different um, amount of sunlight that each uh, depth will get, and then the different types of plant species that you'll usually find um, within those areas. And this is a good example um, of Pleasant Lake. Actually, Lauren's pretty familiar with that one, um, of how we divided those AROSs into um, those you know, different community types and then the different depths as well. And then um, within those areas, we sample, um, if Mark, if you wanna go to the next slide. Within those areas, um, we take rake toes, we do vis visual observations, and then we also use um, our sonar unit uh, to look at the different types of vegetation that are within um, those sample areas. And the sonar um, is really great, especially for the deeper areas, because um, if you noticed from the previous slide, there's you know, a picture, there's some areas where there isn't necessarily where we grab those samples, but we still go over those areas just to make sure those are the super deep areas, um, the areas that usually don't get any sunlight, but we do sometimes find vegetation down there. Um, there's a couple lakes that we find aquatic mosses on, um, sorry, stonewort can be in those deeper, deeper areas. So it's really good to double check those um, with the sonar to see for one, if there's any vegetation there, but then for two, we also take uh, rake toes just to confirm um, exactly what that species is. Next slide, please. Uh, so for Jocelyn Lake, um, when we conducted the survey on June 7th, um, we found that desirable native plant species uh, were cara, variable pondweed, sago pondweed. Um, I've got some examples here for you, just so you can see what those species look like. Um, horn pondweed is another one, which is really fun to look at because it has cute little flowers, um, usually in the early season. And um, we saw some naiad and common bladderwort. Uh, these are all really good native species, um, really good to see on lakes. And uh, we also noticed that variable pondweed and sago pondweed were observed at recreational nuisance conditions throughout the center of the lake. Um, so our, you know, when we were out there, these were causing a lot of problems. They were growing you know, really high in the water column, probably getting stuck in your boat props, um, definitely causing some recreational nuisances um, where you can't necessarily navigate through this area very well. We also noticed that spatter dock, water lily, and water shield dominated the near shore habitats. Uh, if you want to go to the next slide, please, Mark. And at the time of the survey, um, these species didn't necessarily show any signs of nuisance conditions or deterring navigation because they were near the near shore, but they did inhibit um, some of the ability for some people, residents on the lake, um, to, you know, get to access to the lake. And so you probably noticed that that was growing um, around your dock or, you know, around the boat launch area. Um, so these might, you know, this might be something that may have worsened throughout the summer growing season. Um, so we observed this in June. So that was kind of early season um, to look at that. And usually when we conduct two, two different vegetation surveys, we'll do one in June and then we'll also do one in August um, because some of these species do grow you know, tend to grow up more as the summer progresses, um, as there's more nutrients in, in sunlight availability, you know, which um, definitely aids in, in plant production. Um, the red areas here highlighted is where um, we noticed a lot of those water lily spatter dock and water shield in the near shore areas. Um, the red just uh, indicates how the densest um, amounts of species are there. So it doesn't necessarily mean like there's a huge, you know, they're all going to inhibit recreation or your ability to get to the lake. Um, but this just shows where there's the most dense um, amount of species. And I just wanted to highlight that on this all species map. So this map is actually showing 
um, a density, like a density map of all of the species on the lake. So especially near those near shore um, areas highlighted by the red polygon um, that's showing, you know, where we saw a lot of those mostly water lily, water shield and spatter dock um, in these areas. And then Mark, if you wanna go to the next slide, please. Now, the other species that we also observed uh, during the survey were Eurasian water milfoil, curly leaf pondweed, and starry stonewort. Um, these are all what we call invasive species or ecological nuisance species because they um, are you know, invasive. And so they disrupt the ecology, they cause you know, harm to the environment um, based on disrupting fish habitat, you know, outcompeting native species, um, and they can even cause uh, economic harm. Um, so, you know, if they completely destroy, you know, take over your lake, then you can't recreate or do anything um, that you wouldn't normally enjoy on these lakes. Um, so that's why they're called invasive species. Um, and they're also non-native to the U.S. So these species, um, like Eurasian water milfoil, was observed at very de varying densities in the southeast um, east, southeast, central, and west, northwest portions of the lake. Um, they were both in shallow and deeper areas and exhibit, this um, species also exhibited the highest um, level of nuisance conditions um, when compared to the other invasive species. So Eurasian water milfoil, um, actually Mark, if you wanna go to the next slide real quick, then I can show you those maps. So you can see that Eurasian water milfoil um, to the left you know, it's kind of more towards the, the west side, northwest side, and then also kind of towards the middle and then the south, southeast portion. Um, so, you know, near the boat launch uh, is pretty typical when you see those species. Um, but also, this species also grows pretty high and can top out. Um, and as you probably observed throughout the year and also during uh, these conditions, it can cause, um, you know, those recreational nuisance conditions. And it can, you know, get stuck in your boat prop. Um, curly leaf pondweed, on the other hand, you know, usually the species is pretty bad in the beginning of the season, so early spring, um, because it'll grow under the ice. Um, and then as the season progresses, it'll usually just kind of fall off as the season goes. It's just kind of natural, naturally senesces, um, but it definitely causes those early season um, nuisance conditions, like around Memorial Day um, or like in May or end of May is when you know, you're starting to get out on the lake and, and you can, a lot of other lakes, um, you know, have a lot of problems with curly leaf pondweed. Um, but then towards the end of the year, it, the herbicides used to treat Eurasian water milfoil um, also affect curly leaf pondweed. So it's kind of nice, um, you know, to be able to use that to kind of hit two birds with one stone um, if that's ever an option. And then starry stonework, um, that species, you know, it, it appears to grow pretty low lying, um, at least in the terms of when we were there um, in June, uh, but later in the season that species can definitely, you know, balloon up and it can take over. Um, it's definitely more, it's like a cara species, so it's a macro algae, um, just like cara, and that species, um, they tend to stay a little lower, uh, but starry stonewort being an invasive, um, we can also see it, you know, top out and actually become like four feet, five feet tall. I mean, it's, it can become these massive mats. It's, it's insane. Um, so at the time of the survey, when we conducted this in June, we didn't necessarily see that. Um, we did see, you know, some uh, denser areas like near the boat launch um, to the south, and then also those other areas on the map uh, that are like yellow, you can kind of see where it's kind of getting pretty heavy. Um, but for the most part, we saw pretty lay low, lying low in um, June. And Mark, if you want to go to the next slide. Now, the other thing that we conduct um, when we're out there is through this information that we collect, um, we like to you know, run it through a series of metrics to show you kind of like the health of your lake. Um, so I can go through just you know, briefly what each of these uh, metrics mean and then what your score was, which is a then 2021 survey score. Um, and then we also show the range and then what the goal is um, for each each lake. So a species richness is basically the number of aquatic plants that we found on your lake. Um, more species are generally uh, indicate a healthier ecosystem, but you know sometimes not all species are desirable, like three of those species are invasive species, um, but you had a really good um, high species richness, which is great to see. Uh, the Shannon Biodiversity Index is a measure of the plant species um, 
diversity and distribution evenness. Um, and so that also indicates the plants community, uh, the stability and the diversity of your lake. Um, and then along with that is the Shannon, Shannon morphology index. It's a measure of the plant morphology. So like how it looks like, is it, you know, beneficial for fish and um, macro invertebrate habitat quality. So like having different types of plants. So um, you have like the car that's more low lying, but then you also have, um, you know, the like different um, pond weeds. So some of them have really skinny leaves. Some of them have really big broad leaves. So all of these different types of morphology are really good um, for different like ecological niches that each of those uh, species are going to take in. So like the fish are gonna utilize you know, these different types of plants in different ways, um, and as well as macro inverts, um, which is great for the whole ecology of your lake. Now the floristic qual quality index is a measure of the distribution of the desire desirable aquatic plants. So this is used in the Midwestern states um, for aquatic habitats. And the higher scores indicate an increase in biodiversity and a positive ratio of desirable species versus undesirable. So that means you have a lot more, uh, based on your scoring, it means you have a lot more uh, desirable species than you do undesirable. So that's also really great. Um, and then the recreational nuisance presence, um, we, that is based off of like the percentage of survey sites um, that we found uh, to have aquatic plants that were inhibiting recreational activities. So according to um, the score here, so 33% of those observations, um, we found that there were some plants um, inhibiting uh, recreation. So the goal on that one is less than 10%, um, which would be ideal. And a lot of the time we see those problems, you know, definitely in the early season where there's, you know, a lot of plant growth and things like that. And then um, as the season progresses, you know, that can change depending on what kind of management um, you have on the lake. And then as well as, um, you know, just the different types of species. So like curly leaf pondweed, um, you know, usually is a big problem early in the season. And then as the season progresses, sometimes that, that um, drops off usually. Um, so then sometimes we'll see in lakes that are overrun by curly, you know, the recreational nuisance will be really high in the beginning of the year, but then as the season progresses, um, that'll drop off. And then the recreational nuisance isn't um, as bad. And the other uh, metric that we look at is the algal bloom risk. So this is using, um, well, based on characteristics of your watershed around your lake. Um, so lakes with watersheds that are high proportions of, you know, land and agriculture and urban land uses are more likely to be at risk uh, for algal blooms because these land, like those land uses contribute more phosphorus to your lake um, than grasslands or forests. Um, Jocelyn Lake, uh, definitely met the optim optimal management goals uh, for Shannon Biodiversity, the Shannon Morphology Index, and the Floristic Quality Index, um, which is great. And that indicates, um, you know, really good plant diversity, as well as uh, good habitat for fish and macro inverts. Next slide, please. Um, so we also looked at uh, what Lauren mentioned, how Doug Pullman, we kind of work with Doug Pullman, um, and we were able to obtain some of the historical information uh, for your lake. So in 2015 and 2016, um, these are the years that we were able to obtain information and compare that to 2021. Um, we, do, we utilize this past data uh, to analyze the changes over time um, in aquatic invasive plants. And, um, you know, looking at these ones that are more targeted for, for management activities. Um, we looked at coverage and dominance. Um, they were comparable to native species in Jocelyn, but Eurasian water milfoil and stray stonewort uh, definitely have increased, um, have exhibited an increasing trend um, over the last six years. Um, there is a gap in the data. So, I mean, that's definitely something that, you know, would be nice to have be able to fill, um, but we can definitely look at, you know, the, the past um, and then compare that to, to this year and what we observed. Um, so this is the, we're looking at the frequency. So the frequency represents the percentage of the survey sites where the given species was found. Um, so this is suggesting that, you know, the species were more wide, widespread throughout the lake in 2021 than in 2015 and 2016. Um, and, you know, the most recent activities, management activities, um, you know, 
targeting herbicide treatments in 2014 and 2017 um, necessarily have not reduced the spread of these aquatic invasive species. Um, but that's, you know, again, you know, we just are looking at the information from 2015, 2016 um, and comparing that to this year. Next slide, please. All right, so in terms of future recommendations, um, it would be beneficial to definitely have a two year uh, vegetation survey. Uh, like I said earlier, you know, the earlier in the season, we tend to see, um, you know, different plant species and then also like different um, conditions. And then being able to compare that to like August um, when, you know, the height of the plant growth um, would definitely be more beneficial. And plus, um, we can assess the aquatic vegetation during the growth season a little better. Uh, this information that we collect during these surveys um, definitely allows us to readily and consistently identify any successful lake management activities, um, as well as highlight potential issues requiring an intervention. Um, and we can gather the critical information necessary to improve the lake's ecology and the recreational conditions. Um, the other thing that we noticed too is that the aquatic native plants, uh, such as like sago pondweed and variable pondweed, um, they tend to create recreational nuisances, um, especially throughout the middle portion of the lake, um, and they inhibit safe recreation. Uh, one thing to keep in mind is, you know, Eagle, which is the um, environment, Great Lakes, and energy, uh, the Michigan's, um, the state of Michigan, uh, permit or restricts. Uh, has special restrictions on native species um, and it also limits like offshore herbicide treatments greater than 100 feet from shore um, or to the five foot contour, whichever one's closer to shore, um, to only non native species. Um, so that's another thing to keep in mind. Like, if you do want to pursue any management of these species, you need to keep in mind um, the restrictions that Eagle has in place on the native species. Um, so, other options that we kind of, you know, could think about um, is, you know, using herbicides if that's um, an option, uh, but definitely we need to double check with Eagle and then adhere to the restrictions because they are native species. Um, but another option is mechanical harvesting, um, which again is like giving your lake like a, like mowing your lawn, you know, it's not gonna get rid of the plants, um, but it will keep down those nuisance conditions um, for at least some time. Um, but it's definitely something that, you know, definitely need to explore and especially look at, assess the costs. Uh, because, you know, both of those have, you know, associated costs um, with each of those different management options. And um, when it comes to uh, invasive species, um, you know, there is historical information online um, from 2017 or from, sorry, from previous years uh, about chemical management um, for Eurasian water mill foil. Um, but seeing this increase in coverage um, since 2016 surveys, uh, you know, we definitely should look at potentially new strategies, uh, maybe different chemicals, um, you know, different methods uh, or even biocontrols. Um, our, you know, researchers that were out on the lake, uh, especially having, you know, more naturalized shores with Eurasian water mill foil, um, you can you can definitely utilize those those milfoil weevils. Um, but again, that's another thing that you know the biocontrols is something that isn't necessarily shown you know any definitive um, results. So at least with the milfoil weevil, so it's definitely important to um, you know look at those other strategies as well. Um, you know chemicals as as well as because the state does allow a lot of invasive species. Um, management with chemicals because herbicides are pretty effective and that'll help with we've at least seen with a lot of the lakes um, at least with seasonal um, uh, recreational nuisance conditions and seasonally you know it does help uh, to drop those those species out of out of the water column um, but it doesn't necessarily you know long term it doesn't necessarily help you know eradicate those species because that's not going to happen with invasive species um, because eradication is um, you know, almost impossible when it comes to um, those invasive species nowadays. So um, it's just important to look at, you know, the different types of uh, potential management um, alternatives uh, that we can have here. Um, and starry stonewort is another one to think about um, because it was intermixed with Cara 
Uh, and while we didn't see any nuisance observations um, at the time of the survey, uh, it definitely can grow to nuisance conditions quickly. Um, and it's definitely important to, you know, be aware of these uh, conditions and to warrant treatment um, in a timely manner. Uh, but with it being intermixed with CARA, it's really important to limit the treatment only to areas can, creating nuisance conditions um, because, you know, you don't want to hurt that native species, which is actually out competing, you know, helping to compete with the invasive species. Um, so it's only recommended that, you know, treatment occurs when, when nuisance conditions exist, at least for starry stoneworm. Um, yeah, and all right, so that's the end of uh, my information. Um, yeah, if you guys have any questions or comments, um, I'd be happy to, to help out. All right. Um, are there any questions um, here in the, um, go, okay, go right ahead. And then I'll. Um, when, uh, Gabby, the last treatment on Joslyn, was that 2017? Yes. Yeah, okay. So the 2016 data shows the and that we did that, how long was that in effect, that last treatment process? How many years was that? Well, going? the original SAD was for five years. We started in 2009. And they, uh, we, they collected monies uh, two and a half, basically two and a half years. They collected 100% first and second year, 50% the third year, collected no monies. Uh, the other two years. But we were able to, because there were some funds left over and, and the county was very helpful in getting that used because it was our money, you know? And we ended up getting the treatment in 2017 because the lake had responded very well. And uh, except that, I know sometimes I'm not sure about the starry stone work, but the duration uh, of so we did get a later treatment. And then we started, we tried again in uh, 2019 to set up a new SAD. I think that's a question I have to use later about SADs. So, um, so that was the last time we had a, and you can see what the lake is like. In, so it was suppressed in 2016, the last data. We could assume it was still suppressed in 2017, the last treatment. Probably. Yeah. And then all that growth is within the lab since 2017. Yes. Correct. Well, yep. In fact, on the, on the metric chart, I had a question on that. The, okay. The lake scan metric results where the 30, the 2021 survey said 33%. Is, is that coverage or is that just a nuisance factor? That's um, just a. A nuisance factor. So that's um, so the recreation nuisance. Um, that's the percentage of the survey sites that I that we saw recreation activities um, inhibiting. So that also would include like the the water like the water lilies and water shield that we saw along the north the western side. Um, so those could be perceived as a nuisance because they were you know potentially growing. Um, around docks and around, you know, those areas. So that's, that's the other thing to keep in mind too. So like, you know, as it might not be necessarily a nuisance, um, but it was, you know, a portion of the lake um, where you did see. Your <laughs> is kind of disturbing if you, if you look at it. By the way, this whole report is out on the website if you haven't looked at it, but, um, uh, and, yeah, I mean, this is the one I referred to when I look at coverage. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, um, uh, so that was... What is it, let us show us what you're looking at. Yeah. Sure. This chart, uh, you know, it should be, see, that's page 14 that you're on, Gabby. Go to the coverage. If you haven't seen this, like I say, it's on the website, but that's what they found. The EWA yeah. is the Asian. <clears throat> so, our surveyors, um, when they were out, so looking at, uh, so if Mark, if you want to go to the the map of Eurasian Water Milk Oil Curly Fund, we sorry, it's somewhere. Um, so, based on I don't know if you want to look at the left hand map. So the Eurasian water milfoil map, um, you can see that there's like these patches kind of, of dense 
milfoil. So that is showing just like the areas. So if treatment was warranted, this is where, you know, the heaviest portions of um, Eurasian water milfoil was in that, you know, that red polygon. Um, and then the yellow is where it's, you know, doesn't necessarily, it's a lot less, um, so a lot less coverage, uh, so very light coverage, but, um, you know, may, may need treatment um, based on, you know, what uh, people on the lake needs, like what your budget are, and then also um, understanding, you know, do you want to target these not as, you know, not as dense areas. Um, so based on the coverage within that AROS, um, there was Eurasian water milfoil found, but it wasn't necessarily enough where it would be, you know, I would say like if you could target a specific area, it'd be that red polygon um, on that map that you're showing. And then the secondary area would be the, the yellow. And then the green just shows where the, those were all the native species um, in the pond meets uh, where you're having a lot of, you know, thick um, sago and variable pond meat growth. Um, and that's just showing kind of where those areas are of where the invasives are and then where the natives are. Um, and then based on like the most dense areas, you know, if you want to target any invasive species like this, the red area would be something that you want to target first. Um, and then depending on how, what your funds are and then how much you know, you you want to treat on the lake, then you could maybe target those yellow areas. Did that answer your question? Yes. Okay, perfect. And the actually the starry stonewort worries me probably more than the milfoil. The milfoil we seem to be able to knock down very easily the last time. Mm -hmm. uh, and if, based on your other chart, it looks like the starry is increasing. And this is the weed that covers the bottom and reduces the spawning areas and stuff for the fish. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that's a really good, I mean, the, yeah, it does. And the other thing um, about Starry is that it's really difficult to treat. Um, so you can hit it with, with algicides, uh, but the state, especially with a lot of the, if you look at that map, um, a lot of the dense areas are in the near shore. Um, so now the state is restricting, um, at least from, I think it's May to June, uh, treatment of Starry, you can only do 25% of the shoreline. Um, so oh. that's something that, you know, if you do want to look into Starry treatment, um, they're doing a lot more restrictions on copper, copper uh, because of fish spawning and fish habitat, um, and they want to reduce the effects um, on those species as much as possible. Um, the other thing too is that we observed a lot of the starry was intermixed with cara, um, which is a native macro algae. Um, so that's where, you know, if you do want to do treatment, we recommend you only do it on the areas that are like overblown with starry because you don't want to hit that native species either. Um, because that native species is also out, you know, competing with the starry. I mean, the starry definitely has an advantage because it is such a voracious grower. Um, but so we have found in other areas where cara, um, has actually been able to outcompete it and has been able to kind of keep it at bay. Um, so that's, you know, that's something to keep in mind because the things that you would use to treat starry stonewort would be the same thing that will kill Cara. Um, so you just want to keep that in mind. And starry doesn't, it, all it will do is it'll just burn the starry um, because the way that it grows, we've never really seen any eradication or complete control with herbicides or algicides, sorry. Yeah. And I'm sorry if you can hear my cat crying in the background. She doesn't like it when my door shuts. So I apologize for that. You're fine, Gabby. <laughs> now, does the treatment that you provide, uh, I know it, it seems to attack the Eurasian very well, and we keep the starry in check. Does it uh, eliminate some of the curly leaf pond weed as well? Because it's getting bad. Yeah, um, from my understanding, a lot of the herbicides that are used to also treat Eurasian water milfoil can also, um, will also affect curly leaf pond weed. And in the lakes that I found, like curly, um, you know, it has some really interesting uh, overwintering uh, in reproductive structures. So like the turions, they're like, I don't know if you've ever um, thrown a rake into a lake before and rake, you know, just like, because uh, whenever we're throwing in rakes, you know, or pulled up some curly leaf pond weed, um, they have these like overwintering structures, which are like turions. They kind of remind me of like um, like a sawtooth blade, but not really kind of pine coney kind of feeling um, like structure. And those things, you know, they're really um, 
terrible. So anytime that you're doing herbicide, like it'll definitely keep, you know, it'll kill off the, the curly fast, um, but it won't ever get rid of it uh, because, you know, curly pond weed, it's, you know, you can throw whatever you want at it and it'll, it'll definitely, um, you know, help with the nuisance conditions and for that year, uh, but it'll still be in your lake for years to come. Um, so it, but yeah. it doesn't require harvesting. Uh, it can be controlled with, with chemicals. Yep. Yeah. I know some lakes that do harvesting as well. Um, but that's only one. Um, and it still comes back every year. And like I said, it's like, you know, cutting your, or like mowing your lawn, like it'll grow back. Um, but the herbicides I've seen it to, it definitely turns it into mush. Um, so it's definitely out of the water column and, you know, you don't necessarily see a lot of grow back, um, from that species if you use the, the herbicide. Um, but at the same time, like that species does tend to drop off, um, throughout the season, just naturally as an S. Um, but I mean, if you're seeing more of a, more of a problem, you know, it, it probably would be good to do something about that, you know, especially in the early season. Cause I mean, by the time that it'll senesce naturally, it'll be like August and that's, most of the summer, so. One question. When you treat it in 2017, it's, it's just for that year, right? Or does it yes. last two years? No, it was just, just for that year. And <laughs> the, I don't know how long a treatment might last. I don't um, have a, a, enough knowledge, um, so I'll let Gabby and Mark answer that, but typically um, we've never had to not treat on our special assessment district. So Gabby, if you could talk a little bit about um, it, it, the, I mean, it just, it, every year varies. So it depends on what's gonna be really happy that year. This year was curly leaf, pond weed was really good. Um, but I'll let Gabby talk about uh, treatment year after year. Yeah, um, yeah, Lauren, that's a good, you know, good point. Like a lot of our lakes, you know, we usually have to treat every year. Um, but the thing is too, like on some lakes, um, like one of the lakes that we had been working on with the state uh, for Custer, um, they hadn't had any, any treatment, um, in the past years. And so we helped with the management yeah. program and we actually did see year to year, you know, less and less volume, um, and, sorry, coverage of Eurasia one and milfoil. Um, so each year we didn't have to treat as much. Um, so that's something to consider too, uh, because there are some like the hybrids, the Eurasia one or milfoil hybrids, um, as well as, you know, these plants become somewhat herbicide resistant, um, but the technology is also advancing. Uh, so that's something to consider too um, every year, you know, because as, as the plants are advancing, there are people who are working on, you know, trying to advance these herbicides to make them more effective um, and to be able to treat these species. And, you know, since you haven't necessarily had year to year to year treatment, um, you know, it might be something where, you know, your plants could definitely, you know, be impacted really well. Um, based on the new technologies um, that are around these days. So, you know, it is definitely lake specific because it can also depend on, you know, is what kind of strain of, I guess, herbicide, or not, sorry, herbicide, but um, Eurasian water milk oil you have. Um, and then depending on how herbicide resistant it is, um, is also something um, that definitely makes it, you know, whether it's effective or not. Um, you know, on some lakes too, like we've seen, you know, had a lot of your age milfoil foil throughout the years, like it just has cut back, cut back. And now it's just like, you know, you just see the little patches here and there. So, um, you know, it won't ever be completely gone uh, because, you know, eradication is almost impossible when it comes to these invasive species. Um, but at the same time, you can definitely knock it down um, and knock it back. And, and this is Mark. Gabby had mentioned uh, some of the biocontrols that have been looked at and one of the the notions that's been out there for a number of years has been the weevil to attack Eurasian water milfoil. And, and it's really kind of hit or miss. Um, some of the lakes that had spent a number of years to year after year after year uh, plant weevils that feed exclusively on Eurasian water milfoil or hybrids, they've really seen uh, success in keeping it control that it's you don't get the big mats that uh, you just have the extended uh, shoots on the surface and almost like laying down a, a rope mat on the surface there have been other lakes that have tried the weevils that just there's been no success and and that's that's really kind of a long-term process to look at that and so the balance certainly is looking at is what can we do to address the issues this year? But also have that that same notion in mind is 
this is going to be a long-term process. So not just combating it one year, forgetting it until the next year, but really trying to take that longer perspective. I think that's some of the information that uh, comes out of the lake scan approach. Um, Starry, interestingly, is one that, uh, as Gabby has said, it's, it's really not very susceptible to algicides. Uh, it's highly competitive in some areas. We're seeing it outcompete even Eurasian water milfoil and the hybrids. Uh, Highland Lake there in Livingston County uh, is, is just overrun. And they literally were having chemical treatments almost 10 times in a summer. Uh, some of those areas, repeat areas, uh, but Doug Pullman used to describe it as whack-a-mole. So it, it will show up in one area and actually through the summer, it will die back in some areas, grow up in some of the deeper areas with some cooler water. And so this, you know, an algae like Starry is really a challenge. And what they looked at is the alternative in Highland Lake rather than just constantly just burn off tops is can you physically remove it? And that was the other notion, uh, the other approach that Gabby had talked about, the DASH, the Diver Assisted Suction Harvesting. So there, there are, uh, there's no perfect method out there to really combat the invasive species. Um, and it will vary from lake to lake. And so the key is once you find something that's effective is really making sure that you, A, you stick with it and B, you track it because if it becomes less effective over time, that's when you have to adapt. And so that, that's part of the battle with aquatic invasive species is you may be able to successfully knock it back. You can't ever get rid of it, but things change and, and unfortunately something else tends to pop up. So it, it's certainly a balance over time. And that's where the monitoring is really important to be able to, to look at it and understand is like, all right, what happened early season? What are we seeing late season? What does that portend for the following year? What kinds of adjustments need to be made? So there again, that's, you know, that's recommendation that comes across is making sure that you're tracking it well so that you know what's out there, what's been effective, what hasn't been, and then use that to just to continue ad continuously adapt your program. Okay, I think that is um, So uh, best scenario in the, in the <laughs> And uh, that we could come up with would be actually annual treatment for for the lake. In other words, this obviously having this gap of several years just creates a bigger problem and, and a more difficult one to solve. So if we could, uh, ideal, and this goes back to establishing the SADs, uh, why it's required to do every five years and why it with uh, it just couldn't be a continuous uh, function. You know, in other words, once a lake is determined to have, you know, invasive species in it, that, that and the SAD gets established, it, it just seems like you should be able to survey it every two or three years, whatever the case like they did, um, and say, okay, yeah, then we need to allocate <coughs> Kaiser, uh, how we run our programs is you get a survey every year, um, it, multiple times a year. Um, and so it's a, Gabby, it's a spring survey, an early season survey. And then after any treatment, they do a, a spot check survey and then uh, the year end survey as well. So how many times are you out on Pleasant? Four, maybe five times a year, if that, three? Yeah, um, definitely three. Uh, three. But then if there's ever anything, you know, you know, our clients ever need us to like check on anything. Um, we're always in the area um, yep. and we can always pop over. Um, and we also communicate a lot with herbicide applicators as well. And, you know, if anybody has any concerns, you know, we're definitely in communication um, and want to be, you know, on the lake as soon as possible. Um, yeah, so I'd say at least with Pleasant, I would say they're definitely at least, at least three. Um, and if not, you know, up to five, I would say. Is the issue, you know, back to your question, is the issue really more a political one of convincing people to do an ongoing assessment for multiple years rather than a island assessment? I'm not sure what you're asking. Well, I mean, I, I think you're asking why a five year program. Why yeah. Do you well, year? We, yeah, we tried, remember, I talked to you about a 10 year program. Yeah. And I probably wouldn't have to worry about it after that, but. <clears throat> 
the it, it's just it's a it's a real hassle to get an SAD started. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is my second. Time. I'm gonna let Kaiser go. Oh yeah, he's coming. Kaiser, I'm gonna let you guys go. Enjoy your weekend. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Thank you all. Bye now. And then we do have some more questions um, as well, but I will get there after. Um, Terry, I see your questions. I will get to those in just a minute, okay? All right. All right, your question. So the special assessment district, so it's set up as five years, which is a, a normal one. It, it, but we are looking North Lake to go to seven years. So it's not it's not set in stone. We don't like to do it less than five years because it takes too much money um, to kind of start up a project. But if you are many years as the board will approve it, um, I don't think we'd recommend a 10-year project because prices uh, change and fluctuate over the years. But uh, a five year seems to work well, when you're, especially when you're starting to reestablish or start up a new one. Well, it, it would be nice if, uh, if they it kind of renewed, you know, in other words, I understand the pricing and everything mm -hmm. and things might have to be looked at, but if, um, if the residents have said, yeah, you know, we know we've got invasive species and we 51% say, yeah, we should do this. It just seems like it should be a lot easier to renew the SAD than the struggles we go through. So uh, doing that would require um, legislative change um, under Public Act 185 is how I, I run this project. And that 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 act tells me what I have to do. And so that act would have to be changed in order for me to not have to do two public hearings, post to the newspapers, get resolutions. So that's the act I have to follow. I've read that. Yeah. It's quite boring. <laughs> uh, yeah, so there, there isn't a better no. method. Not to have the county involved. But if you're doing a five year, you know, can you <coughs> maybe extend it into a maintenance program? Because the, the last time, the first two years were so effective that they dropped the, the oh, cost sure. of it. Yep. So, you know, people are thinking, oh my God, I'm going to have to sell my taxes forever to have $600 a year. Um, but if you could do it as a maintenance program, it would be minimal for, for the majority of the people. There. Well, and, and that's kind of what we did uh, mm -hmm. in one of your predecessors, uh, Jeff Kersmeer, uh, you know, I was in touch with all the time. And uh, we we're lucky that we got seven years basically out of a five-year SAD. Um, but I think Jocelyn Lake responded very well. Mm -hmm. And boy, <laughs> Two, three weeks and the mill foil was down. You know, the worst of it was uh, seen, you know, I, I can't tell you how many people said, wow, this really worked. And, uh, but it, I, I'm with you. I, I think it ought to be something that uh, if it was spread, because uh, we found out and, I, and I've seen the cost and I at least told the committee people that I expect the cost to be about the same as the last time based on, mm -hmm. and we haven't published those yet because- you they're, not, they're not set either, so yeah. 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 yeah they're kind of- uh, Preliminary numbers. Yeah, <laughs> right now. But it seems like you could say, okay, let's make this a seven year, let's reduce the annual cost by, you know, a few hundred bucks and, and take it over a few more years. And you think it would be better off for the county and the township as well because of the administrative costs involved that if this thing was set up a little long term, there'd be less, I mean, I don't know how much time you put in, but I know you, she's answered a lot of emails and put a lot of time and effort into this that, um, that she's probably not her boss back. Are, are, are there any uh, other lakes that have uh, done, done just that, that uh, maybe have a stronger uh, lake association or something like that, that, that they just agree to it and every year, whatever? Without the special assessment district, or yeah. within the special assessment district? Well, within it, I mean, um, it's, I mean, whether it's uh, uh, something that we look at uh, uh, for ten years, uh, 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 and um, are there some that it's just kind of like an ongoing uh, maintenance? There, like, um, there's there's lakes that we have currently that have um, a lot of money in the budget. And we are able to ex 
extend them without renewing the special assessment district like we did on Joslyn. So if we, the, the funds that are collected for the special assessment district have to be spent on the special assessment district. So everything that I get in has to go out to the lake that it comes in for. And if we do find that at the end of the, the five year program that was set up and we have enough money in the budget and I don't, it's a really busy year and I'm, I'm not, you know, up to, um, to redoing it. I got a lot going on was kind of what we're doing. We are able to do what we did and do a maintain program um, depending on how much money we have left in the budget. We also want to, when, when it comes to that, we want to think about um, uh, other things that could cost money um, that we want. We don't want to deplete the bank too much if you guys are interested in continuing it because the world is changing, the weather is changing. Um, you know, we, I've had two confirmed harmful algal blooms this year. Um, and so those are things that we also want to keep a reserve for because if you guys are going to start getting those we, we need to be uh, you know proactive and reactive on it, it, it or other invasive species that might come in we want to be considerate of that as well too so we do keep like a contingency budget to cover any um, additional random costs that might come up now once we get in the swing of things it's not that it's not that much to renew. I mean, I have you guys a special assessment district. I have the, the lines. All I have to do is check with the assessors. We have to host the two public hearings, which yes, is a lot. But after that, you know, people are kind of used to it. It becomes routine. And it's not as big of a hassle as this to get it kind of on board. Now, do you have to pull DEQ permits every year or do they issue that permit for the uh, time of the SAD? For the herbicide treatment? Pardon? For the herbicide treatment, what permit? Yeah, in other okay. words, the permits you need to have. Oh, that was a big problem, by the way, at one year that we had uh, getting the permits issued. Um, we let it lag for a year. And yep. So you have to. Um, the permits can be applied for for multi year, um, and it depends on your applicator. Um, some applicators don't like to do multi year permits, um, and I get it. And then some do. I um, mean, they can be applied for multi year, um, but Typically, um, I think only one of my lakes has a multi-year permit right now, but a year, it's, a, it's an every year permit. Um, the permit costs did recently just increase this last year, that they will be increasing this next year. And they have not increased since 2014, so we're going to see a slight increase in permit costs this year. Um, but it is something that the applicator has to apply for either yearly or every couple of years, depends on how he writes the permit. He owns the permit, or the, he or she. The applicator owns the permit for um, oh, lake the, treatment. Uh, the county does not. Nope. No. So I no. Permit. I do not have any involvement in the issuing of the permit. Okay. So it's so all the applicator. You hire the certified yep. applicator. Yes. Yep. I hired. Um, we put out for bid. Um, so it is a, a public bid process uh, for these projects. Um, and so it is. Um, it, it, we will contract with the applicator. Um, who works the bid process with us that will be awarded the project. So let's go, what do we do next? <laughs> I have a couple questions on here. Uh, so I wanted to make sure I get to um, Terry's questions. Terry asked, um, are there septic systems and lawn fertilizers affecting the uh, floor in the lake? 100%, um, um, if you guys have septic systems that have not been inspected, you guys are not on septic, okay. Beautiful. Okay. Um, okay. So yeah, if you have a if you have a uh, a septic system that's not working properly and has not been inspected, um, yes, that could be leaching into the water column, which eventually gets into the lake. The fertilization of the lawns. Yes. Yep. That's that's helping. Um, the phosphorus is definitely increasing the nutrient load in the lake. If you if there's a lot of geese on your lawn, there's a lot of ducks on your lawn, you're not trying to, you know, combat them, that's gonna, that is going to add nutrients to your lake, which is going to help the plants grow because the plants feed off of the phosphorus. Um, seeing, um, seeing a lot of talking a lot with people is there is phosphorus stored in your soils and it is very nutrient rich soils. And so over the years, phosphorus gets stored and then it gets released. And so the impacts that we could do to limit the phosphorus, um, and if it was successful, would not be seen for many years because there's a lot of stored in the environment already. But yes, anything that you could do, if you put a buffer zone, you do a buffer strip, you do any sort of rain barrels, rain garden, 
anything to filter the water before it gets into the groundwater system or the lake system can help reduce the nutrient load that's then feeding these plants. When you say that the geese, how do you, you just like control the geese? There's not a great way to do it, but they have like determent. Like they say, you know, don't don't mow your lawn real low. Have a a native shoreline. Have plants growing. They don't. They want the they like the open space. Um, and there's some documentation that I can share, um, and some research I can share. But they are um, they when they poop, they add nutrients, which then get into the water system. And so it, it's really important to try to, to make your yard as unattractive to them as possible. That's another nuisance species that we have to address. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'd like to learn more about that. All right. Of course, just email me. Um, I have a Oakland County did a great handout that I um I've been sharing. Because I saw people putting this like foil thing on the lawns. Yeah. They have they have so many things. They have little blow up things that you can do. Little, you go to one of the conferences for the lakes, and they always have all these geese to tears. So it's good, a big good dog. Is yeah, the best one. Oh yeah. I'll take it. Follow up. Yeah, take Charlie. Maybe we should Charlie and Bella. What's that? Charlie and Bella. Yes. Yes. Two horses would be running around. So to to get started, to answer your question about getting started. Um, it's on the, um, the local residents to work with your township um, to then have the township pass a resolution to petition the Board of Public Works. And so once um, we receive a petition, the, bo the board is not obligated to take the project on. Um, it does have to be reviewed internally. We do take it to the Board of Commissioners, we review it with the Board of Public Works, and then if I get the go ahead from my director, and then I will start setting up uh, public hearings. So, and we've got your other, and I know we've got your support, ma'am, and Dr. Uh, Hutchinson, and Mark uh, was saying earlier that go ahead and get started. Let's get signatures. Um, we've got the sheets that we started. We, we've got actually. We're at 39% right now. That's pretty good. And I just did, based on what you, you folks gave me number wise, I just did some quick math. And, uh, that's still a ways off. We, we need 51%. I can't review that. Just focus on the people you know that are supportive. Don't try and change people's minds necessarily. You know, that it, it, you're wasting your time and effort, but if you can locate at least, excuse me. <laughs> We have other things going on now. <laughs> They're trying to divide. Oh, that's another thing. Congressional district, right down 52. Anyway, the Linden Township would be divided. Congressional mm -hmm. districts. Crazy. Um, so that's kind of where my head is right now. Um, but anyway, just practicalities to, to get 51%, just focus on those people that you know are supportive. And um, yeah, it's just, just a tough time of year right now uh, to get those, but I will start sending out. Uh, I got just about everybody's email address. I've got telephone numbers, and we'll just break it up between the committee to get uh, signatures either. Now, I did one family, they pulled the form down, printed it, signed it, scanned it, and sent it back to me. I assume that's acceptable. And uh, yeah. The well, let's say uh, Thursday night, we just had a uh, public hearing with the Sugar Loaf Special Assessment District because they wanted to raise their assessment more than the 10% provided by statute. In fact, they wanted to double it because there was no foil and uh, trying to deal with matters there. Anyway, uh, they had the petition, they had the physical signatures, and then they also presented like a, a spreadsheet of all the residents in. Uh, the special assessment, the, the partial ID, and then the names of the people on the parcel and then signatures, um, which is very helpful. But we get, they have to be physical signatures. We have to make sure that they are. But a scan should be acceptable. At some point, we have to have the original, I think. So they could mail it. Yeah, right. Really? Okay. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's what we said. We want to make sure that the petition has the original signatures. Because I, you know, the last time I did this SAD, I never even turned the forms in. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want to hear that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I still have them. Well, 
but uh, yeah. I never turned them into anybody, so I was that's well, I'm I'm an attorney by trade. <laughs> and just so, uh, means I just want to make sure that you know. Well, okay, so I can't use the scan signature. I have to have the mail done. Back. What about DocuSign? That's it. I think that's sufficient. Yeah. DocuSign is what I. I the difference between DocuSign and a scan. It's it's like a legal. You can legally yeah. sign a document. Well, I, I don't use know. DocuSign all the time. Yeah, when I buy a house, yeah. Uh, right. Right. If it's good for legal stuff, I mean, for real estate, it should be good enough for us. So it's an option. So when you did this before, and how much resistance was there? Um, I don't know. I mean, it was door to door. We just refined with 51%. Yeah, actually, yeah. the first time I did this, I got 61%. But when I did it the second time, I got 2019, 2020, I guess, Lawrence, the first big course. First COVID hit, but we had, uh, I had sent this out, and I was like thirty six percent response. So the rest were no's or no response. So it didn't go well in twenty nineteen. Well, yeah, that's a, that was a bad time because the pandemic. Yeah, yeah I mean, COVID certainly didn't yeah. help, but, but people just still, don't want to address that. So. It uh, it struggled, but it struggled over here. But um, we'll pursue it. We've got you know, kind of whole no. group working on it. I thought, I mean, some of those graphs are pretty impressive. The tables, you know, it might, might think it's helpful to have any people that are totally probably aren't going online looking at this stuff. Yeah, and this report, by the way, is on the website. Uh, if you haven't been out there. And like I say, the one I passed around was the one that I thought was really scary. When you look at that much of the lake covered in, in weeds, and uh, you know, as most of us were boaters or you know, fishermen, were concerned, uh, that lake could turn into a swamp. I think with the, you know, the, the nice color one that would be nice to have for them to go around to the back of the neighbor's I think, yeah. yeah. <laughs> People, I think that was the shocker one. I well, that's separate, but I like the pot where it has the dots too. Oh, and that, by the way, they that's shocking, but that, that could be a little bit misleading. Right, it's, just, uh, yeah, it's yeah. a little more shocking. <laughs> oh, it is. Yeah, so I, I but, thought the one in the original no foil in the spot was uh, depressed. Sorry, uh, or you know, had uh, we showed it 16, 17. Yeah, right, 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 right. Right. Oh, yeah. yeah. So the effectiveness of the previous program. Right. Like that. Yeah. And so when the is it will wipe out the fishing population. And it, it grows. And, and keep in mind, it's not going to go away. None of this stuff is not going to get rid of it. All you can do is maintain it. I do have some online questions I wanted to answer um, really quick to be respectful of, you know, they're here too. Uh, the mechanical harvesting an option to begin with and follow up with maintenance, chemical treatment, or is this much more costly? Mechanical harvesting is beautiful for certain plants. Um, your mofo, we do not want to harvest as a plant. I do, we do not recommend harvesting for it, it spreads by fragmentation. Um, and so that is one we definitely um, only use herbicide control on. And herbicide control is a bit more expensive than mechanical harvesting. Uh, mechanical harvesting can be very expensive. It can be up to uh, $600 an acre, uh, depending on the plant that you are choosing to harvest. So um, there also has to be a good access spot for the harvester to get on the lake and a good offloading spot. And so those are things that I struggle with on my other lakes is um, access to the lake and ability for the machinery to um, to cut the, um, the plants so like pulling it all up in our props and having to the stuff up, we're, we're just yep. helping spread it. Yep. Yeah. yeah. So we bring it over to a different side of the lake and make mm -hmm. it off our props and stuff. Okay. Yep. And of course you uh, everybody brings up the weevils. Do it naturally with weevils. Yeah, and like Mark said, it can be great on some lakes. I think it, it's it is a it's not just one thing that's going to fix it all. So just doing herbicide treatments not going to fix it all. It's going to take, um, you know, you guys being aware of what's going on, 
um, you know, letting me know if things pop up where, you know, between surveys, it's you guys doing your part to reduce the nutrient loading into the lake, um, because I can only do so much um, with the education, but in, in making sure that, um, you know, you guys are rinsing and drying your boats before you're bringing them back into the lake um, is a big one as well, too. Um, it is a state law, but it's not really enforced. Uh, but just it's it's more of a it's more than just me prescribing treatment on a lake. It, it's it's a holistic approach for everybody to have to change your kind of mindset of no, you don't need a green beautiful lawn on your lake. No, you shouldn't have an artificial beach. You should have a buffer. You know, you 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 need to start looking at these things together because it's not going to be a quick fix yeah. by any means. Well, I heard many about chemicals. That's yeah, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. You're poisoning the lake. I just want to ask you one technical question about signatures. What does the county require when you? Nothing. I don't. I don't. Under the public act that I one eighty five one eighty five does not require signatures. That is an um, oh, that's true. that is yeah. you. And so it's you. We recommend that we will strongly encourage that you don't come to us with less than fifty or sixty percent of the. I think it's two thirds. My boss said two thirds yeah. of the support. But it's it's really. That's up to the townships. Okay. So, but I think under 188, I think you have to have 51 percent. Yes, I believe yeah. so. Which is the township. Yeah, we we'll do the town to do it, but the 85 does not. Yeah. So, so I don't know. I don't want to be too strident on that. To you. Huh? We need to get enough signatures to you. Right. Uh, to do the, the resolution by the first end of the first quarter. Yeah, I'd like to have the resolutions in hand by March, early March, late February. Okay. So that I can start um, booking your township hall for public hearings. Okay. Um, and getting my board on board. Okay. Um, I also have another question about should the septic systems and fertilization issues be addressed before starting another abatement program? We support the wheat abate abatement, but are concerned about the conflicting activities. I mean, yes, yes. Ideally, in a perfect world, you'd get the septic systems all inspected and. Can you mandate that? No. Um, the Washtenaw County has a point of sale. Um, and so when you sell your house, you have to have it inspected, but there's no other um, uh, like laws or um, statutes that I can mandate that. And it's not my department as well, too. Uh, that's all environmental health. But um, yeah, they should be. Um, but there's nothing in saying that we we have to. Um, it, it is an ongoing thing. It's, it's something that we can uh, work with residents on, provide education, um, you know, give resources to. But there's nothing saying we have to mandate it. It'd be great, but we can't. Um, and this presentation is being recorded. I do have to figure out how to record it, um, to take it off the cloud. And, and we're gonna put it up on Joslyn Lake as well. Barrett's asking that. The internal process for review, it's not a very long process. Um, we're all aware that this is wanting to start up. And so there are discussions that are already happening with my director, with the Board of Public Works. Um, pretty much the thing is taking it to the board of commissioners, um, which my my director would handle that, taking it to the board of commissioners. Any other internal questions? I don't know if there's an, there's nothing else left online. I, yeah. yeah. resistance to a blank organization, you know, you, you, it would be ideal. The, the only difference there is uh, you might end up collecting the dues, you know, doing this out of dues. And a lot of people, I get a lot of pushback about when I mentioned the association. And, you know, ideally that's probably what you need. Mm -hmm. Uh, I can't tell you, I've been involved in association and stuff like that. And you get a lot of pushback. If somebody says, I don't want anybody to tell me what color to take my color. Well, you know, well, like, a lot of associations do yeah. go out oh, yeah. the weeds. That's where I live. I am part of the association. Oh, yeah. The lot that is, is deeded to our 17 homes is that way, flat where I have that party. So we have a whole order. So you're, you're going to do it, right? And I, yes. And I'm the president of it. What? How much longer are you doing? Um, I, I have no end time. I'm going to wipe out. 
Yeah, we probably should be good. Because uh, I have to close up the mall. So, <laughs> so we're getting <laughs> kicked out. <laughs> How long you were going to continue? You don't have to go home, just can't stay here. Oh, can you get five more minutes? Yeah, oh, sure. Okay. Yeah. I just had a question of so if this, if we get the approvals, we are more than 50% by the end of this year or whenever. When would this start? When would, would the payments go on next year's taxes and when would they start treating? So the, um, you would get assessed um, if, the pay, if, the, if the Board of Public Works up, um, approves to proceed with the project, which will happen at the second public hearing. Um, that has to happen before um, August, September, because that's when we set the rules. And then that's when we, yeah, next year. And then that's when we would send it to Linden Townships. And then you guys would put it on the tax, the winter taxes for next year. We would start treatment in 2023. And that's kind of what we talked about in our first meeting. Um, Lauren had already cautioned me that probably nothing was going to happen. <laughs> yeah, it takes a while because we, uh, my assessor needs it by a certain time to get it to your assessor to then get it on the winter taxes. And that's right. So if you go on the December tax bill 2022. Two. Yeah. And, and then uh, treatment would start in 23. So with that, I guess we can start. Going out, get signatures, and we'll figure out how best to do that. I'll get, I think. Well, Can I just ask one question about like the uh, assessment? Um, is there a, a percentage, you know, because we were going around and talking to people both in uh, Lakefront and uh, Backlot? Mm -hmm. um, is there, what is the percentage that, uh, uh, how that split? Is that, a, is that set? It's a great question. Um, and people who did this prior to me didn't have a set percentage. Um, I have worked with my director um, very um, closely on these numbers, um, but no, there's not like a, there's no like statute that says we have to do it at a certain percentage. Um, it's all based off of um, what the budget is and then the benefit. But that's a great, great question is there is nothing that directs us how to do that. that, that shows I honestly don't remember. I mean, I got the date, all the data right here on what they did last time. Uh, I guess we could, I could figure out what that percentage was. Yeah, but that could not necessarily be the same for this one, right? Uh, correct. It's it because I'm adding. Um, I think the DNR was in charge last time, were they? Um, but I'm adding them into it. Okay, so I am going to um, end the the Zoom. Uh, Terry, there is. Um, she did ask a question about uh, fertilization. Um, yep, there is, um, but it has to be on a township level. Um, that your township has to then um, ban that sort of fertilization stuff. It's not a, a county um, wide thing, but I don't think Linden, do you guys have a fertilizer ban? A what? A fertilizer ban? I don't know where okay. that doesn't mean. <laughs> <laughs> we, will, we will figure that out, but I'm going to pause the, um, the meeting. I'm going to get it posted. Um, I'm going to send it over to Jim to get it posted on the website, and any questions can be sent um, yeah, after. If you put it on your website, we might be able to 